right, so awesome. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be speaking to you guys today. I'm a research scientist in a basic research lab at New England Biolabs, and we've been utilizing smart sequencing to quantitate and detect DNA damage genome-wide, and I'm gonna tell you guys about this project. So our lab is interested in archaeal DNA replication and repair. We really wanna understand the enzymes that are involved in faithfully replicating the organism, um, performing leading and lagging strand DNA replication. So I'm showing you right here. Oh, this is delayed, very bizarre. And I'm also interested in understanding archaeal DNA repair. So this is the cascade of enzymes that are responsible for recognizing a wide variety of DNA lesions, removing them and repairing them back to canonical DNA. So their model organism in our lab is Thermococcus cotocorensis, which is a hyperthermophile that's found in deep sea vents. And in the lab, we use a variety of different experimental techniques to understand archaeal DNA replication and repair. And today, I'm going to tell you about our utilization of next generation sequencing to understand DNA replication and repair in Thermococcus cotocorensis. So what we broadly want to do is be able to detect and quantitate a wide variety of different DNA modifications genome-wide. And when we looked into the literature, we saw that there wasn't really a good sequencing technique that enabled this. So this is why we set out to perform and create our own sequencing technique. And we turned to the sequencing technology that we all love, uh, smart sequencing. And the reason we chose this platform other, over other ones is for many reasons. First off, at, um, at New England Biolabs, we have an RS2 and a SQL available to us just for basic research needs. There's about 15 research scientists that use this, and we're responsible for creating our own libraries, sequencing our own runs, and doing all the data, an data analysis. So this is readily available to us, and one of the reasons that I chose this platform. Secondly, we chose the PacBio sequencing platform because of the uh, library preparation scheme. If I'm interested in uh, isolating and locating DNA damage, I want that to be in my library. And PacBio is currently one of the only techniques that allow you to create a library without any amplification or um, enrichment steps. So any sort of DNA damage that's in my isolated genomic DNA can end up in my library. And then thirdly, the reason we chose PacBio is because of its ability to detect non-canonical bases. Currently, it can detect 6-methyl A and 4-methyl C based upon a slowing down of the polymerase translocation during sequencing. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this image, but over um, on the top here, we have... Yeah. Here we have T being incorporated across 6-methyl A, and we see a delay here for the polymerase translocation, which is called the interpulse duration, where canonical T across canonical A has a shorter interpulse duration. So there are two major hurdles that we must overcome in order to use PacBio smart sequencing to detect a wide variety of different DNA modifications. And these um, Hurdles are, one, we want to detect a wide variety of modifications, and currently PacBio can only reliably detect 6-methyl-A and 4-methyl-C. And then secondly, we want to be able to detect stochastic DNA modifications, so random DNA modifications across the genome, and I'll go into that in a little bit. So first, let's talk about this first hurdle. So in RADAR-seq, which stands for Rare Damage and Repair Sequencing, we create your typical PacBio library as we um, as everyone typically does, but we leave out repair steps so that any sort of DNA lesion that we're interested in is now in our PacBio library. We can nick at that particular lesion with a repair enzyme responsible for nicking and removing that, repair, that particular DNA lesion. We then can fill in with a patch of modified bases, and this modified bases contains six methyl A and four methyl C, and then ligate with TNA ligase, uh, with TAC DNA ligase. So in a one-pot reaction, we have removed our DNA damage site, and we've now incorporated a patch of methylated bases. And now anywhere that there's a patch of methylated bases, there was originally a DNA damage site. And here's an example. And here's an example of one of those patches. Here's a 38 nucleotide patch where you see high IPD, high IPD ratios at A's and C's. And this presence of this patch, um, and as, as opposed to a single high IPD ratio, gives us confidence that we've created a NIC and we've performed NIC translation at our damage site. And so we can do this with a wide variety of different DNA lesions and modifications. Any sort of DNA modification that has a associated repair enzyme that's responsible for recognizing and nick it. So here is a variety of the different DNA lesions that we can now detect using RadarSeq. 
So we've overcome this first hurdle, and there's a wide variety of modifications that we can detect. So if you're unfamiliar with the way that the IPD uh, modification um, process is currently done by PacBio, what happens is all your fragments that you have sequenced are aligned to your reference, uh, your reference genome first. And an IPD ratio average is created across um, every genomic position. So if there's no lesion or, high, or no um, modified base present, we end up with an IPD ratio of one. And there isn't an issue when we have a methylation motif, such as a motif that's occurring in every single genomic position that is methylated, and we do our IPD ratio analysis, and it's averaged across all positions because it's in every single fragment. But the issue becomes when we want to be able to detect these patches of modified bases, and they're in random locations throughout the genome, and when we now try to do the typical PacBio uh, modification detection analysis, we can see that the signal is now washed away because we're averaging IPD ratios across all the fragments. So what we've done is we do something called stratification in which we create non-overlapping layers. So here I'm showing you six different layers of the genome which do not overlap, and then we perform the IPD modification analysis on each layer so that now we can obtain the IPD information on each individual fragment. So now we've overcome both these hurdles. We can look at a wide variety of DNA modifications, and we can do stochastic DNA modification. So the first thing we set out to do was to validate our workflow, and in order to do that, we chose a nicking enzyme, which nicks at a very specific sequence. This nicking enzyme is NBBSRDI, and it nicks at the sequence CATTGC. And because we can go and look for where all those CATTGC sequences are in our genome, we can then look for a patch of methylated bases there. And I'm just going to give you the overall result. So here is um, our Thermococcus cotocurrensis genome. We've treated it with MBBSDR, MBBSRDI and done our NIC translating protocol. What I'm showing you on the outer two rings are the known MBBSRDI sites, and in the inner two rings are the sites that we've located with radar seek. So I just want to hone in this section over here where you can see on the top strand we have a cluster, um, a cluster of known sites, and radar seek picks those out. And then on the bottom strand, you see we're lacking sites, and RadarSeq doesn't pick up any. And if you align all the different NBBSRDI sites, and we look at the IPD ratios of A's and C's, you can see there is a high IPD ratio right at that NIC site, and then it trails off. And this is um, because of that patch of modified bases that we've incorporated. So now that we have this in hand, we can go and look at a wide variety of different DNA modifications. And the first one um, that we looked at was ribonucleotide incorporation. So RNASH2 is an enzyme that's responsible for nicking ribonucleotides that are incorporated by the sequencing polymerase. And so what we've done is in this workflow, we are creating our PacBio libraries. Any ribonucleotides that are in the isolated genomic DNA are now going to be in our library. And we nick with RNASH2 and then do our fill-in reaction. And we've done this for both Thermococcus cotocurrensis and E. coli on wild-type genomic DNA. And then, with genomic, and then with strains that are lacking the repair enzyme RNASH2. And you can see an increase in the amount of our um, ribonucleotides in both the Thermococcus cotocurrensis as well as in the E. coli strain, showing us that we can uh, reliably detect these ribonucleotides in the genome. <clears throat> and we can also look at it on a genome-wide scale across the entire genome to look for hot spots. So as I've told you today, RadarSeq enables the detection of a wide variety of stochastic DNA modifications on a genome-wide scale, and we're using this for a variety of different um, projects. So some of our current projects are, la are tracking lagging strand DNA polymerase synthesis. So with a little bit of genetic trickery, we can now track lagging strand synthesis in E. coli. Um, this is looking at ribonucleotide incorporation by the uh, lagging strand polymerase. And what we can see is these crossover points from um, the top strand to the bottom strand, and this is the origin of replication in the termination sites. So we're hoping to utilize this to understand DNA replication in our model organism Thermococcus cotocurrensis. We're also using it to look at damage in Thermococcus cotocurrensis, such as um, DNA deamination. And if you realize, you can use RadarSeq to, do, to look at anything that nicks the genomic DNA. So anything that's nicking and you can create a patch, you can do this process. So we're looking at AF target effects of, Cas9, of Cas12a, determining the formation of secondary structure, and most recently we started a collaboration to look at the DNA damaging effects of DNA in space. So there's definitely room for improvement, and so in version 2.0, we're going to kind of overcome some of the pitfalls of RadarSeq version uh, 1.0. 
And so our current problems are that we do not have single base resolution. As I told you, we have modified A and modified C, and we're lacking modified G and modified T from the nucleotide pool. So we want to be able to have a modified T and G to have single base resolution. We want to be able to detect closely spaced lesions, and we want to be able to do radar seq on larger genomes. And our current efforts are to look at a wide variety of different modified Ts and modified Gs. And here are some examples of the modified Ts and Gs that I've used to incorporate so that now we have all four of our uh, nucleotides modified so that we can have single base resolution. So with that, I just want to thank you guys for listening. Um, I want to really thank the Radar Seek. It's all done at NEB and a lot of the uh, data analysis and um, uh, pipeline for the uh, detecting of the patches was done by Vladimir. We have a great NEB PAC bio group and of course the people at Pacific Biosciences, Mike Weand and uh, Xander Watson for all their help along the way. So thanks.